Library, and I'm in charge of all the education programs from second grade all the way up to uh, adult learners uh, such as yourselves. Last year we did 30,000 students that came through um, and did our education programs, um, and we did about 4,000 students through distance learning. 
uh, where we broadcast out across the world, actually. As far as we've gone so far is Australia, and they tell me that's as far as you can go before you start coming back. So I think that's hit the limit. Um, the other thing that's cool about Australia, uh, when you do a distance learning for that, is that it's actually the next day there. So as an educator, it's what you always want to be able to teach to the future. <laughs> so I'm trying to get one of them to hold up a stock sheet, you know, uh, but they haven't, uh, haven't done that. So, um, so one of the other things I do is I go around and I talk about Roosevelt type topics. And the one I'm going to talk about tonight is, um, is about hobos. And I got interested in this because, um, you know, we all have sort of this romantic vision of hobos in the back of our minds. But um, I have a 17 year old son and a 15 year old daughter. And a few years ago, uh, they started calling each other hobos. You know, uh, you know get, get your feet off the couch, hobo. Um, and they just started calling each other, you know, hobo. And it uh, sort of got me interested in the, in the topic again. Um, and hobos are, are really, um, I think, a, an interesting topic because they speak to a, a specific time in American history. And they speak to a lot of economic and social um, aspects uh, as well. So when you teach about the Great Depression, um, most people believe that the Great Depression started in October of 1929, right, with the stock market crash. And that is a particular time that we can point to as a, something of a, of a starting point. But it actually, the Great Depression started for farmers almost 10 years earlier, um, with the, uh, the beginning of the, of the Dust Bowl and such. And when we teach about um, the Great Depression, we teach about it as if it's an economic topic. You know, the stock market crashed and, you know, everybody lost their money and their jobs and all that sort of stuff. And it certainly was an economic crisis. But beyond that, it was also a spiritual and an emotional crisis. And we tend to forget that. We tend to uh, not teach that when we talk about it in, in schools. 25% um, unemployment on average during the Great Depression. As high as 60% in some places. So one out of every four people were out of jobs. Um, some places, you know, six out of ten people were, were out of jobs. And the job, um, by not having a job, you're obviously not getting a paycheck, right? And that's important because you use the money to stimulate the economy by buying things that you need, and, you know, that creates, a, you know, a demand, and then the supply, and then you know, the economy begins to pick up from there. But the other thing about a job is it gives you a purpose. It gives you um, a function, a place in society. So if you're a teacher and you lose your job, are you still really a teacher? You know, if you're a farmer and you've lost your farm, are you still really a farmer? And those of you that are retired, right, you know, you'll probably uh, identify yourself by what you used to do. I'm a retired pharmacist, I'm a retired doctor, I'm a retired fireman, you know, that sort of thing. So Roosevelt understood how important jobs were because it gave people a purpose and a function every morning when they got up, they go to work and they do what it is that they do. They go and they do their job. So yes, it was, certainly was an economic crisis, but it was also a spiritual and emotional crisis as well. The suicide rate tripled during the Great Depression. People lost hope, right? They lost their jobs, they lost their sense of identity. Um, back then at the time, it was primarily a male-dominated society, so if you're the breadwinner in the family and you've lost your job, you've lost an important part of what your identity is. I'm the guy that's supposed to provide for this family, and I can't do it. I can't do it. So the suicide rate tripled during that time. Um, if families had, um, let's say, uh, you know, um, children that they couldn't feed, they might leave them in an orphanage. They might leave them in a uh, post office, some federal building, where hopefully someone would come along uh, and take care of them. Um, if you've ever seen the, the play Annie, right, that's basically what that, what's that about. Um, at that time. And it also was a time when families tended to collapse in on themselves. So if you had a grandma or a grandpa that couldn't make it on their own, they might move in with you. If you had a 17 or 16 year old son, you might simply have to throw them out of the house. And that's where a lot of the hobos came from. You know, we can't afford to feed you. You know, you're 17 years old, you gotta go make it on your own somehow. So it wasn't just a pocketbook problem. It was a problem of the heart, with these families collapsing, and it was a problem of, of the mind as well. People lost their identity. People lost who they were in, in the society. And that had a huge, huge um, impact. 
So these are the sorts of um, the background that's kind of playing into uh, what's going on in terms of uh, the development of, uh, of the hobos. Now the, the term hobo itself, where does that originate? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows for sure. And if you ask a dozen people, you'll get a dozen responses. Okay, but I'm gonna give you three, um, which are just as reasonable as, as any uh, of the rest. Some people say the, the term hobo came from soldiers after the Civil War who were homeward bound. So where are you going? I'm going home. Hobo, 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 right? So it came from that, um, some folks say. Others say that it came um, from the boys who would work with hoes and would go farm to farm or place to place looking for work. You know, so they were hoboys, hobos, right? Going from place to place looking, uh, seeking um, uh, some kind of employment. Others say it just came as a, as a greeting. You know, hoboy. And you know, as people were moving from place to place, nobody really knows. So it depends upon you know your perspective, and you can argue and such with your with your friends. So it's anybody's guess as to where that came from. Now, what is a hobo? That has a much more specific uh, definition and a much more um, important um, understanding of what a hobo is. A hobo was a, a migrating laborer. Right, so a hobo wasn't necessarily a derogatory term. What a hobo did was a hobo went from place to place to place looking for work. And they very often carried something like this, right, which is known as a bindle stiff. And it was usually kept over the shoulder like that. And off they go. And they're able to you know, walk up and down and do what they need to do. Imagine all your belongings tied in a little package next day. You know, right? So that's your kids, right? Um, sometimes you find a little good luck charm on the end of the other end. Uh, very often it was a key, usually a key to the home that they left. And they kept that there as a reminder that someday they were going to return home. You know, this when I get back, I'm going to turn that key and I'm going back. For the time being, off I'm going. Now, it was also going around, and we're going to take a look at what a hobo might carry in, in a couple of minutes. There were also what we know as tramps. Right? And a tramp was somebody who would go around and work if they had to, but generally tended not to want to work. So if um, someone was a tramp, they might come into Millbrook and you know find okay, well you know kind of hungry, you know, um, knock on a door and ask for some work. Right? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll rake these leaves back here. You give me a sandwich. How about that? And they rake the leaves. You give them the sandwich, and that was the end of the transaction. Whereas the hobo was looking for some kind of more long-term uh, employment with you. And I'm not, I'm not talking years, you know, maybe a week or two, um, you know, stay in your barn, stay here in your garage. You generally didn't let these folks into the house because very often they were dirty. And you just didn't know who they were, right? You didn't want, you know, somebody like that coming. You never could tell if uh, someone was casing your house. It usually <coughs> wouldn't be a hobo. It probably wouldn't be a tramp. But then there was a third category of people, the bum. And the bum was someone who didn't want to work, <coughs> who wouldn't work, and was more likely to, to steal from you and rob from you. Usually the bums also had some kind of drinking problem, which might uh, contribute to their, uh, their inability um, to work. So there was a hierarchy. If you were a hobo, that was the top, because you're willing to work, you're just going around from place to place looking for a job. If you were a tramp, all right, I'll work if I have to, but I'd rather not. And if you were a bum, no way I'm working. Okay? So if somebody calls you a bum, all right, that's not good. If somebody calls you a hobo, that's not so bad. Okay? So you can play around with that with your friends and neighbors. Um, why did people become hobos? Generally, it was economic necessity. Right? There's no work in Millbrook, I'm gonna go uh, out to Pine Plains and see if there's anything out there. If there's no work in Pine Plains, I'm gonna go uh, down to Hopewell, see if there's any work there. If there's no work in the whole Hudson Valley, I'm gonna get out of here and I'm gonna go look someplace else. Economic necessity. And during the Great Depression, there were actually times where, um, you know, uh, chambers of commerce would put up big signs saying, you know, uh, homeless men continue on, there's no work here. You know, to sort of get the hobos to, to keep uh, moving through. I don't know, I have a picture of that. So I'm going to show you some pictures um, 
of what we're talking about in terms of economic necessity, right, when these people are, are moving around. Um, this is how people looked and lived during the Great Depression. And this is the famous migrant mother uh, photograph. So I'll pass those around. Here's a, a guy loaded up his family. He's lucky enough at least to have a car. He's not, he's not walking. Um, and they're moving along. But look at, the, look at the wear and tear on their faces. Right? This is the kind of way people are living back in those days. Imagine coming home, and this is home. Um, this is the shack, made out of you know bits and pieces of things that you find. A little girl out in the front, sitting on a car seat that's been removed from, a, from an automobile. So I'll pass that around there as well. Um, are, these, are these pictures from Dutchess County? Or? No, these pictures are not necessarily from Dutchess County. Um, these are pictures that were taken by an organization called the FSA, the Farm Security Administration. And pretty much any picture you've ever seen of the Great Depression was taken by the FSA. It was a government program. Uh, Roosevelt started it, and the idea was uh, they gave um, uh, uh, people, photographers, cameras. And they said, go out and take pictures. And they gave them a, what's called a shoot script, a, a list of things they wanted pictures taken of. And the idea was to get a baseline of how bad things were in the country. And then when the New Deal programs kicked in, to go back and take pictures again and show how much better things had gotten. And they took something in the neighborhood of 80,000 photographs all across uh, the country. Um, here is a picture of a family who's been evicted, and you know they're loading up what they've got, and you know there's a mean-looking cop standing here, making sure that you know they're loading up their stuff and they're and they're moving along. Pass that around that way uh, there as well. Okay. So economic necessity is pretty much what drove you uh, to be a hobo in most cases. Now sometimes um, it wasn't economic necessity. Sometimes it was just a matter of adventure. And this is the one that's caught on with, with most people. Um, this idea of, you know, the hobo adventure life, you know, uh, riding the rails, going out there, making your way in the world. Nobody's, you know, got control of your time. You go where you want to go, you come and go when you want to go, and, you know, the, the world is your, is your playground. Um, some people went out for that purpose. Most people, it was economic necessity. Um, very often, uh, another reason you might go out is simply as escape. You need to get out. You need to get away from a bad marriage. You need to get away from um, maybe some bad business deals in your town uh, that you know you weren't able to live up to your end of the bargain on. Maybe you were one step ahead of the law uh, for whatever reason. Um, I uh, had talked with a hobo woman. Uh, somebody here said, who was it that said, oh, you wanted to be a hobo, but they wouldn't let her because girls weren't hobos. There were girl hobos. There were lady hobos. And I spoke with a woman one time who was a, who was a hobo back in the day. And um, you know, I asked her, well, what made you, you know, become a hobo? And she had worked on a farm. And she had a bunch of older brothers. And she was working on a farm. And one day, um, in her, you know, her family farm, she was uh, milking the cow. And uh, the cow, uh, just as she would finished getting the, the bucket or the pail full, kicked it over. And she let loose with a string of obscenities because she was bad, and her father smacked her. And uh, she made up her, she said she made up her mind that night that she was going to leave, because if she had to work like a man, she felt she ought to be able to swear like a man. And if she couldn't swear like a man, she was going someplace where she could. <laughs> right? So, I'm not going to argue with somebody that's got that attitude. Um, so, uh, so off she, off she went. And, um, these were the things that, that drove people. Um, the idea of hobos, and, and it's hard to know exactly how many there were, but maybe at the peak there were somewhere between two and three million um, people just riding the rails, moving around the country, uh, looking for work, looking for a better place to be. Um, sometimes these guys would send money home. Sometimes they wouldn't. Sometimes they could send money home. Sometimes they couldn't. You know, sometimes there was just um, there was no way to keep up and no way to connect um, back with the family. The idea of riding the rails, this is a, you know, a term you hear associated with hobos, riding the rails. And what these hobos would do is they would jump on freight trains. 
and head off someplace. So you want to get out of the Hudson Valley, you hop on a train, and off you go. Very, very dangerous. Okay, very dangerous. And usually what these hobos would do is they would create what were called jungles just outside of railroad yards, maybe a mile or so out. And they would um, live in these jungles, and in front of these jungles they would then hop on the trains. Uh, they were usually about a mile outside of the railroad yard because that's when the trains were going still slow enough to hop onto the train. If you waited too much further out, they were at full speed or you know getting close to full speed, and it was too difficult to get onto the to the um, to the trains. They had um, folks called bulls, who were the police that um, you know went around through the um, through the, the railroad yards, and if these guys found you on the railroad car, um, they would they would bring swift and fast and, and dangerous justice. Sometimes they might toss you off, they might smack you over the head with a club, um, they could shoot you, right? And you know, you were trespassing, you were on railroad property, you shouldn't be there. Riding the rails was dangerous, um, and you had to know how to do it. Um, generally speaking, you would try to get in a boxcar, because it gave you the most protection from the weather. The danger with a boxcar is, however, you could get locked in it. And if you get locked in it on a night like tonight, you're gone. Uh, if you get locked in it um, and it ends up on a siding someplace for a week or two, you know, there's no way for you to get out, there's no food, uh, you know, and um, you're at, the, at the, you know, the mercy of the elements. Sometimes folks would get on flat cars. Flat cars were e relatively easy to get on, but they were easy to be seen by the bulls as well. So you generally tended not to try to get into uh, onto a flat car. Um, you never got on a, on a, a car with, with pipes, because pipes rattled and pipes rolled. And as the tracks were going back and forth, you would easily, could easily be crushed um, by, these, uh, by these pipes and things as, as they were uh, moving back and forth. There was a code among the hobos that older hobos took care of younger hobos. So if you were a 40-year-old hobo man and you met a 17-year-old hobo boy, you had an honor and a code, a code of honor, that you were supposed to protect this kid and you were supposed to talk them back into going home. Right, to get them out of the rails, to get them out of the, out of the way. Um, sometimes there were unscrupulous hobos you know, who took advantage of these, of these folks, who took advantage of these kids. Um, if that were the case, uh, and if you were in a jungle and somebody found out that you, know, you were you know, taking advantage of some of the younger hobos, there was hobo justice. You know, and they would take care of that because the important thing about being a hobo was you had this sense of, of honor, this sense of code, because you didn't want to spoil it for the next hobo that's coming behind you. So if you came into Millbrook and you were a hobo and you created trouble, you got messed up with the law, uh, you got drunk, you, uh, you know, got into a fight, that makes a bad impression on everybody in the community about hobos. And the next brother that comes through is going to have a hard time. So you always try to live up to this hobo code, this, this, this honor, this honor code. In the jungle, um, there was usually a mayor um, who was just, uh, you know, usually not elected, but just sort of the, you know, the elder states person uh, of the jungle. And as you went out to look for work, and that's usually what you would do, you'd go out and look for work during the day, and you were expected to bring back something to the mulligan stew at the end of the day. And, you know, if you were working in an orchard, you might be paid four or five apples. You were expected to bring some of those apples back for the jungle meal, for the, for the, um, the mulligan stew. Um, and anybody that put in could take out. It was just that simple. Um, if you couldn't put in, you could get by for a day or two. But... Um, you had to be able to contribute in order to really be able to, uh, to stay there um, as well. Um, riding the rails was one thing. There was also a thing called riding the rods. And riding the rods was if you rode under the railroad car. And there were um, crisscross rods underneath the railroad car that would, um, you know, for, for torque and torsion purposes, stabilize them. And you could ride on those. But you were basically riding on a you know piece of, of you know rod about this big, um, and if you're in the cross area, you know you've got a little bit more stability, but very very dangerous. 
Um, gravel would be kicked up, sparks would fly up, um, embers, you know, from the engine, and the slightest little jiggle or joggle, and you're going down onto those tracks, and that's going to be the end of you. So riding the rails was one thing. Riding the, ro the rods was, was much more um, was much more uh, dangerous. Um, so folks rode the rails looking for work, hoping to bring things back, and there was a code of ethics. And I just want to read a little bit of that to you. Um, this is an ethical code. Now, it was different in different parts of the country, you know, um, and so the, um, you know, some of the rules were different in the West where there was different kinds of landscape and different kinds of weather and such. But generally speaking, um, this is uh, 16 points of the Hobo Code. Um, decide your own life. Don't let another person rule you. All right, so this is, again, a sense of adventure. I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna decide my own fate. I'm gonna make my own, my own way. And going along with that was this idea that if, if bad luck befell you, there was probably a reason for that. You know, you may have brought that on, your, on yourself. So if you go into a town and you get beat up, you know, or they run you out of town, you probably were doing something you shouldn't have done. You are probably violating the, the hobo code. When in town, always be respectful, especially to the law, all right, because you don't want to end up, um, you know, in, in, uh, in jail. Don't take advantage of somebody who's in a vulnerable situation. And this goes back to this idea of if you happen to bump into, you know, a younger hobo, you're expected to be, you know, the elder statesman and um, uh, take care of them. When no employment is available, is available um, and there's nothing, you know, there's no work, make yourself scarce. You don't want to be hanging around town, you know, attracting attention to yourself. Go knock on the door. If there's work to do, do it. And if there's not, you know, go back to the jungle. Uh, don't be hanging around in town. I remember my grandmother used to um, talk about how um, she lived over in um, on the other side of the river by uh, Maybrook, over there, and there was a, the railroad yard over there. And they used to have a pretty big jungle uh, over that way. And every now and then the hobos would come and knock on the door and, you know, can they chop some firewood or something for a sandwich, something like that. And, um, you know, I remember her saying that, you know, they would come, always very respectful, you know, ask to do something, and then, you know, at the end you would be given uh, something for that. And they would never ask for more. You know, whatever you got, you got. You, it wasn't like you could negotiate the old expression, beggars can't be choosers, right? <laughs> so if somebody gives you a sandwich, you can't say, well, I'd like to have a sandwich and a piece of fruit. You know, that's what you got. You got the sandwich, be happy with that, um, you know, move on. Um, in, the, in the jungle community, always pitch in and help. Contribute when you can, and if you can't, um, you've got to find a way to do it. Stay clean. You have to stay clean because if you looked, uh, first of all, for you know, uh, like simple hygiene purposes, you don't want to get sick. But also, when you're going out there to put yourself forward for work, you want to look presentable. Okay, now you're a hobo, right? You're going to be wearing, you know, kind of old clothes or dirty clothes. But you want to be as presentable as possible. You don't want to be looking like a bum. Because right, that's not going to play uh, well for you. Help runaway children and uh, try to induce them to return home. And keep in mind that um, you know your fellow hobo is going to be coming along behind you. Now, have you ever heard of the hobo code? Well, this is the code of honor uh, or the code of ethics. But they also came up with um, with hobo codes. So what they would do is they would make uh, symbols. Yeah in different places to send messages to the hobos that would follow. Sometimes they were carved in a fence post or a telephone pole. Sometimes they were written um, on a sidewalk. Um, and there was various parts of that. So um, I'm going to start off with this one. So if you went to Millbrook and you found a fence post out in front of a house with this in it, would you go in? What is it? <laughs> it's a triangle with two things to come out. All right. Would you knock on that door, do you think? All right. This is a symbol for man with a gun. <laughs> you don't want to knock there. All right. So that's one. Here's another one. This is one of my favorites. And you see this now. You're going to see this. Um, now that I pointed out to you, uh, you'll see this when you go to some craft fairs or antique yeah. shops and things. The dog. Okay. All right. So what do you think that symbolizes? 
Is it a dog? Is it a cat or a dog? Dog. 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 You knew that you could go there and uh, you know ask for some kind of work, even if it was something as simple as, you know, sometimes people would would give you work that didn't really need to be done, like you know beating the carpets or something like that, you know, just so that you know you would have a sense of accomplishing something uh, for the handout um, that you were getting. Uh, here's one. Tic tac toe. <laughs> right? Tic tac toe. But you wouldn't want to play around with this. This is a symbol for a policeman lives here. <clears throat> so you don't want to draw attention uh, to yourself there. This one is easy. Bread. Bread. Right? So you go there and probably get some kind of bread. You know, so it's interesting with these things because some of them were very literal. You know, obviously that's bread. Man with a gun, not so much. You know, um, law enforcement, not so much. This is one. You want to be on the lookout for. This means hobos arrested on sight. So you don't even have to knock on a door. They see you, and you got one of these, or you're looking like a hobo or a bum, you're going to be arrested um, on site. And let me give with, uh, let's go with one more. Um, what is in here? It's like a fish. Getting closer. Symbol for honest man. Okay. So if he tells you something, you know, you're going to be able to be trusting of that, of that person. Remember, you're walking into town, you don't know who any of these people are, so you're looking for these symbols, you're looking for these signs. These are ways that folks would, um, would alert each other as to um, what was going on uh, in a particular place before you ended up getting into any kind of uh, trouble. Now, before we go any further, any questions or comments? Snide remarks? <laughs> oh, Senator Mark, yes, ma'am. No, bum is a bum. A hobo is a hard working guy. Okay. Um, I do have a question. In New Jersey, people remember driving by them, and there were acres and acres of people just living in bathrooms and inns and whatever. In a jungle. Yeah. In the, in the jungle, yeah. yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes. Uh, how do you think that this language, this code, was perpetuated among the hobos? Well, you know, it's, that's a great question. It's, it almost, it starts organically, like any language does. Yeah. And, um, you know, one way or the other, it gets passed on, you know. Um, that's, again, part of the, the code of the older hobos to the younger hobos, you know. Listen, if you see this symbol, you're going to be able to get a good hand out here. You see this symbol, they're going to arrest you on site. And you know, you began to pick it up. It, it was different, just like there's varying um, dialects in different parts of the country. Some of the symbols, you know, change from place to place. But because these guys were moving around, um, it spread pretty quick. You know, and it spread pretty, pretty easily and, uh, and pretty readily. Yes. Is there a whole collection of these pictures at the library, at the FDR library? We had, um, we do have a, a bunch of these. Um, some of these are actually, you're going to find most of them in the Library of Congress. And we had an a exhibit um, maybe five or six years ago, um, maybe longer than that, maybe 10 years ago, um, of FSA, um, Farm Security Administration Pictures. Um, and again, it was this idea of getting the, what it looks like before and then coming along later on. Now, they never got the second pictures. They never went back and took the after the pictures. After the new deal. Well, yeah, because what happened was we got into the war right away. And so everybody had to go off uh, to the war. But Imagine, you know, I talk to kids from second grade to adult learners, and you try to describe what conditions were like during the Great Depression. 
you know, and you know, you know how kids are today, right? Um, I don't have to tell you, but it's hard for them to understand what it was like. Um, but when you show somebody a picture like this, this is Christmas dinner. These kids are having, this is their Christmas dinner. And look how they're living. You know, look what they're, what they're wearing, look how they are. And this isn't, you know, these aren't bad people. These are just people down in their luck. You know, and it's not unusual to hear people from that era who will talk about, you know, we didn't realize how poor we were because everybody lived like this. You know, if there was one family like this in your, in your neighborhood, you might think, oh, okay, oh, and everybody's living like that. You know, that's the way everybody lived, and they're doing the best they can, and here they are, you know, on, on you know, Christmas dinner. Pass that around for you there as well. Okay. Now, what might a hobo have in there? Yes? My favorite reference when I think of hobos is always the, the song Big Rock Candy Mountain, and that the first line of that I never really understood until you presented here, but it said, one evening as the sun went down and the jungle fire was burning, yeah. down the tracks came a hobo hiking. I, I never knew what that meant. Yeah. So that's, well, that's yeah. That was their community. Yeah. But um, I do have another question. Um, sure. To what extent did the hobos benefit from New Deal programs? I mean, were they were they separate from what was happening with you know the CCC or something like that? Or are they taking advantage of those programs like people in settled communities? Sometimes they would take advantage of it. If there was a CCC or a WPA project in town. Um, sometimes there might not be. Sometimes you live in a town so small that you know there was no purpose to put a WPA project there. Uh, or perhaps you were on a WPA project and Work in Progress Administration, and then the job finished, and so you know they already built the school and the hospital, so you know there's nothing else coming to that particular town. So they might move along um, that way. There was a, a, a program called the Federal Transient Program, um, which was designed to help hobos so that you know they could go into town, have a safe place to be. Um, but it didn't really last long because these guys, you know, you never knew where they were going to go and how they were going to be able to, you know, where they were going to move around to. Um, they generally tended to go where the work was. So, you know, if there was a strawberry crop going on, they might all move in that direction. But again, you get there and there's 80 other hobos and they only need 40. I'm not sticking around, right? Hobo code says I can't just sit around doing nothing. I've got to move on. I've got to go on to the, to the next place and the next... Uh, you know, the next way. Um, and again, this idea of usually about a mile out of town, so you it's slow enough to get on to the trains while you can still you can still do it. Yes, sir. Did the high numbers of hobos persist until the war? It did. It did. Um, as things began to pick up, of course, some folks um, you know uh, would, would go back to their communities and such. You know, the idea of going back with the key. But by that time some of them you know grew accustomed to the lifestyle and they kind of liked it. Um, you know, maybe they were less hobo and more, you know, um, free spirit, you know, <coughs> around um, that way. But let's take, did you ever see a hobo's um, bindle stick and wonder what the heck they have in that? Yes. Well, now you're about to, about to find out. Okay. Now, again, you think, well, why is this? They also might have a bedroll, all right? Why do you do this? Why do you have it like this? Because I've got to get on a train with this thing. So I've got to make this as small and simple and compact as possible. Um, you very rarely would throw it onto the train ahead of time because if you didn't make it, all your stuff went off. Okay? So you had to be able to have something that you could hop on and again, you're nicely evenly balanced, you know, I mean with, with pretty much one finger I can hold everything that I need to hold. Um, and maybe I can hitchhike if I if I need to. But let's take a look at what a typical hobo might have in their little bingles. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's take a look. Um, you might have a piece of fruit, all right? And the idea again here is you're not going to eat this up too quickly because you don't know when your next meal's coming. So if you work at an orchard, they might pay you in tomatoes. They might pay you in uh, in, in apples. They might pay you in you know whatever it is. Uh, you know, a chicken farm is going to pay you in eggs. So some of it you take back to the jungle and share. Some of it you keep for yourself because you've got to be able to move on uh, when the time comes. Uh, you might bring a little liquid uh, entertainment uh, along the way, right? Uh, if you could get a little, you wouldn't abuse this because then you would be bummed, 
Okay, we're heading toward a bum. But, you know, you gotta, it gets cold in the jungle at night. You know, sometimes you get sad, you get lonely. You think about the house that you left. You think about the family that you left behind. And you might want to drown your troubles um, a little bit uh, that way. You also might have a Bible, a small Bible. And this comes in handy for two purposes. One is inspiration. And the second is um, make it a good impression. All right, so if you go up to the door, you know, uh, knock, 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 you know, hi, I'm a poor guy, you know, I'm out of my luck, I'd really like to, oh, well, yeah, I was, oh, I was just reading this a minute ago, uh, you know, that, you know, went a long way to, um, you know, to get you through, uh, through the door. Um, also, you might travel with the trusty can of beans. Now, let's see, what was that? There was a regulation, I forget what it was. Uh, that any can of beans could only have 239 um, beans. <laughs> only 239, because if you went one more, it'd be too farty. You also might have a deck of cards, uh, again, to pass the time, right? You wouldn't generally get into bets because if you got into you know poker games and that sort of stuff, A, you had nothing to ante <coughs> up, and B, you were likely to get into a fight. Okay, so this was again mostly um, for passing the, the passing the time. You also might have um, a small bit of candle, you know, something to give you a little bit of light, a little illumination. Um, you wouldn't use this usually on a train because there was always a fear of fire, and certainly a, a flame is going to attract the bulls. You know, they're going to see that, and they're going to come uh, for you. But if you're, you know, off in your corner of the, of the jungle, you know, this gives you a little bit of, of comfort. You also might carry around a piece of coal, mm -hmm. and this was because it was readily available, right? Most of the trains in those days were, were uh, you know, coal fired, and you could use this to. I won't do it here. But you can use this to make your markings um, on the sidewalk or the fence post out in front of you know, a kind lady's house or you know, where a policeman uh, might live. Uh, you also would, would probably have a, a knife, you know, a nice pocket knife. Um, this came in handy for a lot of things. You could carve the uh, symbols into places. You could open cans with it. You could you know, uh, scale fish if you needed to. And if you had to, it offers you protection as well. So this was a very valuable uh, part of your, of your tool. This was something you would use to get water. And the idea is, you know, you don't want to get wet when you're out there because you're going to get cold. And you don't want to get wet because you're going to get, you know, dirty. So if you came up to a river or a stream, um, you might use this to just toss it in, collect up your water, and then, whoop, well, you wouldn't do it that way because it spill out. But you would use this so you wouldn't have to get too close to the edge of the water and you'd be able to, I would starve as a hobo. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. Um, but you know, you would do that to get your water out and you wouldn't have to get yourself wet because you'd have no way of drying yourself. Okay? So you know, simple little things like, uh, like this. You also would, would tend to have some matches right, for keeping warm, for um, lighting your candle, uh, for getting the fire started in the, in the jungle. And then maybe, maybe if you were a little bit, you know, a little bit uh, naughty, you might do a little bit of gambling along the way. Uh, you know, gamble for a couple of tomatoes or something like that. But this is it, right? And the clothes you wore, and maybe a bedroll, and maybe a blanket, um, you know, something like that. But imagine going across the country with, with just this, you know? That's it. No soap? No soap. Now, you might, when you go to a home, you might ask, can I wash up before lunch or whatever? That's when you would do that. That's when you would you know, be able to, to do that. But they also were stories about how people would, um, would keep a sec second set of dishes and things for hobos because they just felt they were dirty. And so, you know, here's your dishes, you know, here's your lunch or whatever. And uh, when they would bring it, oh, no, no, that's good. You know, you, you know, they would want to bring it back into the, into the house then. Okay. Um, but very simple living very simple, and yet everything practical, everything compact, and easy to move around with, and easy to get where you need to, uh, to get to. Any questions or comments about any of that? Yes? Well, not to do that, but they call them hoes. They didn't have anything to do with the hobos or the bums. Hmm. 
That's a good question. Um, I don't know anything about those kind of women. Um, <laughs> just in case my mom's watching. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's that's a different talk for a different uh, a different time. Um, but that's interesting. I, I wonder if that's you know if there's any connection there um, uh, as well. So that's the hobo portion. Now, hobos would live in their jungle with other hobos. There were also these things called Hoovervilles, and Hoovervilles. Um, oh, here's a here's a picture of a family. Riding the rails. Okay, so it wasn't just men, sometimes it was entire families. Um, so you had these, these Hoovervilles. And Hoovervilles were generally, um, it was a, 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 a term uh, coined by a guy by the name of Charles Mickelson, um, who was a publicity chief, uh, I think, with a newspaper in Chicago. And President Hoover was president. And Hoover was not seen as doing a particularly good job at bringing relief to people in the Great Depression. And as people lost their homes, as people lost their apartments and things, um, they tended to live wherever they could live. And they tended to move into these Hoovervilles. Now, whereas a, a jungle would be mostly just the hobos, you know, um, and there might be some women hobos, uh, but it was mostly men, the Hoovervilles would, would be entire families. And you'd come to a place, and usually by a river, because you needed a, a source of water um, for both drinking and also for getting rid of waste, um, which wasn't always the, you know, the best combination. Um, so it was usually along a river or a stream, and they were makeshift houses um, with whatever you could find, cardboard boxes, you know, kind of like what we saw a minute ago. Um, here is a Hooverville. And where is this one? This one is in, um, in California. So I'll give you an idea. And here is a Hooverville at Christmas. Now, again, think about this. You know, here these guys are. This is on uh, East 12th Street in New York City. All right? And this will give you an idea of the spirit like, of these people, right? So, hey, I'm living in a shack. All right? I, I've lost my house. I'm living in a shack. But you know what? I haven't lost my humanity. So I'm going to have a Christmas tree. You know, we're Christians, I might not be able to put anything on it, but I'm having myself a Christmas tree. And, you know, again, it speaks to the, to the way these people lived. You know, they weren't going to give up their humanity simply because of, of what they were. Um, so if people lost their, their homes, they would move into these Hoovervilles, and it was a derogatory term, because you wouldn't have, you know, a good place to live, or you'd have a good place to live if it wasn't for Hoover. So I'm going to move into the Hooverville. Um, and um, sometimes these Hoovervilles would have as many as 10,000 people. They generally tended, there was a lot of them out west and also in the New York City uh, areas in the cities. Um, if you go on the train to, um, into New York, there's an area where you go down and the train goes over the East River. Uh, just as you're coming into New York, there was a huge Hooverville uh, right there. And these Hoovervilles would create their own um, communities. So there would be folks who sort of identify themselves as the police of Hooverville. So if you were stealing something from somebody else, you know, they would prevent you from doing it. There might be a mayor who was, um, you know, kind of in charge of, of the general, uh, you know, there wasn't much way to enforce things other than, you know, simple uh, you know, mob mentality and such. But um, that's what these, these guys would do. There would be maybe women that would take in sewing and they would be, you know, the seamstresses of the, of the Hoovervilles. Uh, and, and such um, that way. Here's a little boy um, from Pennsylvania, and he's looking for uh, coal, coal slag, to bring back to, uh, to heat around the fires um, at his location. They have their own governance, they have their own law enforcement, um, and what happened was uh, California was starting to get so many of these Hoover bills that they actually um, passed laws against them because California being warmer, people were moving out there, and so um, it was an easier life out there. And they had what they called the, 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 um, the bum blockade. So if you were moving into California with no visible means of support, um, the chances are you would be stopped on the main roads coming in and turned away. You can't come in, where are you going? Uh, I'm looking for work, well there's no work here. You know, send you back out, send you off that way. Gradually, 
public sympathy began to, to turn and um, those laws were overpassed or, or overturned and um, you know, California became uh, you know, more welcoming of folks. But there weren't just Hoover bills, there were also um, the Hoover name attached itself to other things. For example, this is called a, a Hoover flag. If you pulled your, your, your uh, pockets out. All right, it's a Hoover flag. What am I doing? I'm flagging the fact I have nothing in my pockets. All right, that's the fact I got him to thank for that. Um, this looks like an ordinary newspaper, but back in the day, this would be referred to as a Hoover blanket. Because you would get this and use this to keep yourself warm. You know, you've seen the you know the stereotype of the bums laying on the side, you know, on the, the benches and stuff with the with the Hoover um, with the Hoover blanket. Hoover, Hoover leather, <coughs> cardboard. Got a hole in my shoe? I'm gonna fill it up with some some Hoover leather um, that way. Um, Hoover stew was any kind of uh, meal watered down. <coughs> So if you were having soup and it was mostly juice, it's a you know it's a Hoover stew, okay, or a, or a Hoover soup. A Hoover wagon was a horse pulled wagon if you could afford a horse, and if you couldn't, it was you pulling the wagon. All right, so you were the Hoover wagon as you uh, as you went through. Now the Hoover bills, um, some of them lasted for as long as ten years. Uh, in some places, and some of them had as many as almost 10,000 people living in them. And once they were established, it was very hard to, to get them out of there because um, they became homes, they became communities, they became places where, where people lived. Now, there were many New Deal programs, you know, um, that were designed to help alleviate these Hoovervilles, to help to, um, you know, get people back in their, in their apartments and their houses and their, you know, their homes, you know, the homeowners, um, you know, um, uh, remortgaging and refinancing and, and those types of things. But this is the way a lot of people lived. You know, this is the way um, a lot of folks uh, had to, to support themselves. So the jungles were mostly men, the Hoovervilles were families. They were people, and there was a huge Hooverville also in um, Central Park, New York. Right by the, uh, in the corner there with the, with the Metropolitan uh, Museum. Um, and these are just people that had no other place to live. So they got tar paper, they got cardboard, they got wood, they got whatever they could, and they made um, they made uh, houses and um, you know um, shelters for themselves, essentially. The Great Depression tried to help all these folks. Well, not the Great Depression. The Great Depression caused all these problems. The New Deal tried to help these folks, and most of the Roosevelt programs were designed to give jobs. Uh, again, the idea of a paycheck, the idea of a purpose and you know, tying into a community. And when you had a program, um, what the Roosevelt administration would try to do was to make it a win-win for everybody involved. So for example, um, if you had a young son and you didn't want him out riding the rails, you might enroll them in the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. And what that did was it took young men out of the cities, moved them out to the country where they made you know, parks and um, you know, campgrounds and those types of things. They got three square meals a day, a nice place to sleep. Mom no longer had to feed them in the city. Crime went down in the city because crime is a young man's profession, right? If you know you're 20 years old, you can't find a job. You know you're going to hit somebody with a head and take the money. And the way it worked was you usually got about a dollar a day, so about about 30 bucks a month. Five of that, the the, the boy in the camp got to keep. The other 25 was sent back to mom to help feed the rest of the family. And that five dollars that that guy got, you know, was at the camp, he could spend in the camp um, canteen. So it taught them money management. Because if you liked gum and you went in and you bought five dollars worth of gum and you chewed it all up in the first week, you went three weeks with no gum. And that only happens once before you learn how to budget your, your gum out and your budget your money out, um, you know, that way. So the time of the of the hobos, you know, uh, and you know when you you see these trick or treaters, a lot of them become hobo, you know, they're hobos, they don't know what to do, so they just jump in some old clothes and, hey, I'm a hobo, you know, trick or treat. The next time somebody like that comes to your door, right, you need to put them through their paces. Ask them for some hobo code, you know, uh, you know ask them, uh, you know, for one of the, one of the symbols and such. Um, a very interesting time of, of American history, about maybe three million people, we don't really know, 
uh, moving around on the rails and such. And there's some of them still out there. Now it's become, um, you know, the, the, the real hobos are gone, but now there's still a hobo culture. And you also will see very often hobo art. Um, and then a lot of times there's like hobo blankets where you'll see, um, you know, blankets with the symbols and things uh, in them as well. Any last other questions, comments, sir? Yeah, uh, covered bridges, was that more where uh, tramps hung out? Probably, yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. Because, um, well, yeah, you know, there or a bar, usually, somewhere near a, near a bar. Um, you know, the, again, these are guys you didn't want to go near. These are the guys that were likely to cause trouble for you, uh, didn't want to work. But the hobos, they were, they were good, solid people. They were folks that you know that were trying to make make a way for themselves in the world without creating a problem for, for anybody else. Yes, we'll go here and we'll talk about that. That picture of the three little kids eating at the table in the background. I don't know how many people noticed the De Laval cream separator. Yes. <laughs> maybe, that, maybe that's his business. Yeah. Little local, uh, yeah, little local connection there, huh? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll bet that other people in the audience probably had similar experiences, but uh, I had two hobo experiences in the late 1940s. Okay. And uh, I grew up in a little river town over in Saudis, and uh, we were up in Ulster Avenue, and our house was located in a nice, nice area, but it was about half a mile from the railroad tracks. Uh -huh. And I remember it must have been 1947, 48, I must have been six, seven, eight years old. Uh, and. Uh, I was playing in the backyard. It must have been in the summertime because of the weather. I was not in school. And uh, I just remember this, this man. He's a very strange man. Ragged clothes. Uh, not, not that ragged, but uh, coming out of the neighbor's yard, his backyard, down a little hill across our driveway and, and, and uh, into our backyard. And he didn't approach the uh, porch or, the, uh, or, or, or try and get near me. But he must have said something to me, neither out of my terror or the fact that uh, he'd asked me, is your mother home? I went inside and got my mom. She came out and they had a little exchange and she went back in. She came out with some food. And she was a person who usually had some soup on the stove or cookies or bread or something out available. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was the little exchange and then he approached the, uh, the, uh, the porch and took it and went and he thanked her. Yep. And he moved on very quickly. And I asked her about it afterwards and she, I'm pretty sure she used the word hobo. Uh, but uh, she explained a lot of us that it was essentially in today's term homeless. Right. Moving on, but uh, I don't believe he asked her for a job. Okay. I don't, I don't remember anything like that, but I remember it was very distinct. And it was a startling uh, event and uh, one you never forget. Yeah. I lived over on the other side of the river and uh, it's all uh, farms and fruits and the migrants would just a wave of people coming up following the crop. Mm -hmm. When they knew the strawberries, the blueberries, the apples, the pears, whatever, yep. they come and uh, set up the little camps. Like mm -hmm. Some farms would allow them to stay. Some of them had uh, just shacks built for those migrants mm -hmm. to, to uh, live in while they just came up to do the crops. And it was hard work, but they were willing to do it for whatever they could get in exchange for that, you know. Um, and that's the big difference between the hobos and the, and the bums. You know, the bums were just looking um, to, for a handout. You know, give me what you can give me. I'm not going to do anything for it. The tramps, are like, you know, I'll, I'll move some stuff around in your garage if you want, but you know, um, then I'm on my way. Where the hobos <coughs> stick around a little bit longer. Some bums stole some of our chickens. Oh, see that? Yeah. Now a hobo would never do that. And I mentioned that to Barbara Kleina. She says. She knew, she knew just what to happen because she says, somebody stole some of our chickens at the same time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes? When did the Central Park Hoover close? Um, that closed down um, in the, uh, just about the same time as the war started, in like 39-ish or so. Um, because then what happened was we started to get into more full employment. And, um, you know, people went to work, you know, women went to work in the factories, the men wore uniforms, uh, you know, uh, and they were able to do that. And, of course, New York had a lot more opportunity than, you know, someplace else might, you know, than, let's say, Saugerties or, or someplace like that. Um, you know, sometimes these things would be there a long time, sometimes they would just sort of pop up and then, you know, work would come along in a town nearby and off they would go and, you know, that was the end of it. 
Um, but again, uh, not a nice place to necessarily live, but the humanity of the whole thing is they made it, you know, as much of a community, as much of a, uh, of a, uh, of a you know, a place to live, you know, with Christmas trees and those kind of things, as you possibly could. I've seen pictures of it, and I think some of them even fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you were going to be there long enough, you might grow some vegetables, sure. Yes, ma'am. Uh, as I say, I lived on the other side of the river, and many of the migrants would just come through. And they had their children to go to school, and our school brought their children in and let them do their uh, English. They're, they're in trouble. They were there to get, get, get along, get some work. My mother told me about a story up in uh, up near Auburn. And she was up there for with her mother or to see her mother, and um, I guess a hobo had stopped by the house there, and he left his violin in exchange for a meal. Wow. Wow. And it was it wasn't a Stradivarius, but it was one of that people value. Wow. She was allowed to play it. Wow when she went to visit her mother, and she talked about playing this violin. Yeah. And that's how this family came by it. And he said if he could, he would come back and get it back from them. Right. And he never came never back. Came back. Yeah. Wow. But again, this sense of exchange. Exchange, Not, yeah. not something for nothing, something but, for something. But a very valuable something yeah. for me. I just want to add something. I had the store in Nova for 50 or 50 years. And the interesting part was in 1948-49, I had a man come in, John, do you know who that was, that man that just went out? No, I know him very well. And he's got a beautiful place up on his nine partners. Oh. He told me he was a oh. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so the next time he came in the store, I took him inside. I says, so and so told me that you were the hobo. Tell me about it. I, you know, you never hear about it. But listening to you telling about all this stuff, this is exactly what you told me the code that the hobos have, and all these things that you just explained to us. And he was a very, very proud. He did it for about two years, he said. And then, you know, he had problems at home, and to get away from it all, he said, I'm going to be home. Yeah, the idea of, of escape. I forgot that. Across the United States. And so let me tell you. Very, um, very interesting talk. Well, I'm glad that, um, that he substantiated what I'm talking about. It might have been my dad, now that I think about it. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, here were some, I, I, I meant to list this, but here were some notable hobos. Um, Jack Dempsey was a hobo mm -hmm. at one point in time. Woody Guthrie, mm -hmm. I'm really surprised at that guy, right? Uh, Jack Kerouac, also. Um, Robert Mitchum. He was. There's one that's like you could just drop your jaws. Um, George Orwell was a hobo for a period of time. Carl Sandburg, and this is the one that shocked me. Art Linkletter. Really? Right. Hobos say the strangest things. <laughs> um, and these are all folks that were, you know, down on their luck and moving around at, at one point. Um, you know, most of the folks, uh, when things picked up, things picked up and they were okay again after that. The migrant um, farmer lady that I sent around, um, they found her, they, they, um, 1979, they tracked her down. And um, she had done well. She had done well, you know. Uh, she got through the Great Depression, and you know things had picked up and everything, and you know she did pretty well for herself, um, you know, despite being, uh, you know, that, that bad off uh, at that time. Yeah, there she is. There. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Kathy. Did, did any sizable number end up in the military during the Second World War? Do we know? A lot, yeah, a lot did, yeah, because again, they were looking for an opportunity, um, and it just it fit right in, right? The whole idea of, hey, service or something, you know, so, um, you know, that was a good way to get employment by going into the into the Army that way, um, and um, many of them had some skills, you know, they had been doing other things, so, all right, I, I can bring the skill to, to my work in the Army, and, and then also learn something from in the Army, and, you know, maybe use that as a trade when you, when you get out. 
That's when they said three hots in a cot. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for having me out, and uh, I hope this was enjoyable. Thank you.